Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated 6th of March 2023 are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. But before starting the discussion, Rao's IAS would like to wish all its viewers a very happy Holi. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 10 and talks about an important treaty which was signed yesterday. Now why this treaty is important? This is a treaty which will allow a unified protection to the biodiversity in the high seas. Now what are high seas? What this treaty is all about? What are the important components of this treaty? Why this treaty is signed? And what are the other associated agreements, conventions and treaty are going to be the part of today's discussion and this is going to be the lead article for today's discussion in the DNS. This article, this topic is extremely important for your prelims as well as the means examinations. So go through this very, very thoroughly. The relevance of this article are from both prelims and the means examination. For example, in the prelim examination, UPSC can ask question with respect to the keywords. For example, what do you mean by high C? Questions on UN clause, the questions on convention on biological diversity, Nagova protocol, Cartagena protocol or anything else. In the mains examination, the question could be asked with respect to the environment section in your GS paper 3, with respect to the environmental impact assessment in the high seas, conservation effort of the biodiversity. Now, as you can see on the screen, the concept of high sea is discussed. The concept of high sea as on the screen is displayed is the area on the right most part. The area which starts from the coastal area includes the internal waters. Internal water is the one which actually forms or are found within the surface border. It may be a river, it may be a lagoon, it may be a coastal lake. So that contributes to the internal water. There is no limit, there is no length which is prescribed for the internal water. It can be 10 meters, it can be 10 kilometers. As far as movement of the outsiders are concerned, so no innocent passage is allowed. A foreign vessel, let's say a vessel from the US or UK cannot enter the Chilika Lagoon of India because they do not have access. Now, who decide whether a ship is going to enter or not? This decision is actually made by the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, which is also known by a popular term UN Clause. Now, UN Clause has divided this international waters and the different coastal zones into five different zones. The first one is internal water followed by the territorial sea. Then we have contiguous zone. Then we have exclusive economic zones and finally the high sea. UN clause is an international agreement. Please understand this. It is an international agreement. It is a convention which was signed by the UN members to which India is also a party. And this agreement, this convention actually sets up a legal framework for the marine and maritime activities. These marine and maritime activities may include the exploration of the seabed, exploration and extraction of mineral resources, movement of commercial as well as security related ships, movement of private individuals even on the water and even the air above it. This agreement provides the legal status to the marine activities, marine borders, as well as marine transportation. Now territorial sea is actually the territory of that particular region. So if the territorial sea is around India's coastal area, this territorial sea forms a part of Indian territory. So a person who is standing on that point, let's say a foreigner will be called to be standing on the Indian territory. So from the territory term, the territorial is derived. Its length is 12 nautical miles. After the territorial sea, we have contiguous zone. The basic difference between the territorial sea and contiguous zone is that there is limited innocent passage in the territorial sea 
The second difference is that under the territorial sea, the state or the coastal state or a coastal nation has a right not only over the seabed, not only over the water, but also the air which is above it. On the other hand, in the contiguous zone, which is 12 nautical miles next to the territorial sea, the bottom rights, that is the surface right or the seabed right and the ocean water right is available to a particular nation. But the air space, the air above it, for example, if a flight is going in the contiguous zone, that flight will not be under the jurisdiction of a coastal state. Hence, after the territorial zone, there is the beginning of the international airspace. So a flight of Pakistan can easily pass through the contiguous zone of India. Then comes the exclusive economic zone. This is the zone up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. Baseline means from where the internal water ends. This 200 nautical mile actually includes the right to exploration for the economic purposes. For example, the exploration for mineral oil, exploration for rare earth material, exploration for sand can be used from this. And after the end of exclusive zone comes the high seas. And high sea is the one which is now holding one of the largest and most diverse biodiversity in the world. So what we require as of now is that we need to protect the biodiversity which is the component of the high sea across the world. We have largest oceans such as Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Ocean which have a very deep and vibrant diversity of not only flora but also fauna. So we have large whales, we have sharks, we have best of the best turtles and their varied species. We need to protect that. But even after the passage of UN clause, we never had a treaty which can provide the protection to these marine organisms. Surprisingly and to a best of the efforts of the United Nations after two decades, now we have signed a treaty that is going to protect the marine organism through a legally binding provisions. Now the important pointers which were highlighted in the article includes that the treaty was in discussion for almost 20 years now. Although the official name of the treaty has not yet been decided, however, major proponents at UN and even outside are now calling it to be the High Sea Treaty. It is going to protect the marine diversity, both flora and fauna, beyond the national boundaries and their waters. It would be applicable to over half of our surface because as we know, three fourths of our surface is actually under the water and it is going to definitely cover half, more than half of our area. This treaty is going to create a new body. So please do not get confused that UN clause is going to look after. International Seabed Authority is going to look after. No, a new body, a new separate organization will be created to manage the conservation of the marine biodiversity. And under this, they are going to establish n number of marine protected areas in the high sea. We are going to look into the marine protected area very soon. This treaty is going to be binding because this is a treaty and treaty is a legally binding agreement. For example, Indus Water Treaty. This treaty is also going to establish some of the ground rules. For example, how the marine protected areas are going to be protected, who is going to give the funds, how much fund is going to be allocated, what is going to be the role of the developed and the developing country, so and so forth. And these rules are also going to be used for the environmental impact assessment for commercial activities. Now, please understand, Coming up of a new treaty to protect the marine biodiversity does not mean that commercial activity is going to be shut down completely. It is going to be provided. There might be some exploration policy that could be undertaken by different organizations, even in the public and the private sector for the exploration of the marine organisms. But that is going to be only after the environmental impact assessment. For example, India has got the right of the marine exploration for the minerals in the central Indian Ocean part from the International Seabed Authority. Now, if something happens in the similar manner in the future, environmental impact assessment is going to be taken up before providing the license for the exploration. If we talk about the exclusive economic zone of India, as you can see, this purple shaded portion is the EEZ of India. It has varied border because of the presence of the Lakshadweep island and the Andaman Nicobar island, the EEZ of India has been 
very larger. Now, India is just sharing the international marine border with Sri Lanka. Hence, the EEZ between these two countries is very, very small. On the other hand, it is very wide in terms of the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. Now, let's talk about what treaty has to offer. First of all, is that the treaty has laid down a legal framework that will put in place 30% of the world's ocean to come under the protected areas, also known as marine protected areas. Now, what is marine protected area? It is a section of the ocean. Please understand this. It is a section of ocean, not rivers. So marine protected area is a section or a part of the ocean where government has placed limits on the human activity. So the exploration, transportation, all these activities are going to be very, very restricted. However, this area or the marine protected area allow people to work but do not damage the environment. Some of the nations have completely banned fishing in a particular marine protected area. On the other hand, some have allowed the entry of the people to their MPAs. As of now, there are around 5,000 marine protected areas across the world that contribute around 0.8% of the ocean surface. One important point to note here is that world's largest marine protected area is the Ross Sea region, which is under the Ross Ice Shelf. If you go through the basic map of the Antarctica, you can see that this is actually the Ross Sea protected area. It is the largest in the world. It is on the southern part of the Australian continent. So over here, you can find Australia. In terms of India, there are 129 marine protected areas or the islands. Government of India have created some of the islands to be part of the marine protected area. The largest number of such protected areas are in Andaman and Nicobar, including the islands. And the largest marine protected area in India is known as Gahir Matha. It is in the state of Odisha. So through the marine protected area, around 30% of the world ocean is going to be protected. The second part of the treaty is that there is going to be more money which is going to be infused for the protection of the marine organism. However, as of now, treaty has not defined. But countries who are signing this treaty are going to provide their own contribution and the percentage or the share of the contribution that they are going to make for the protection of marine organism. And the third is that it covers access to and the use of marine genetic resources. Now, please understand this. Once an area is declared to be marine protected area, it is very hard to take the samples of a particular species. But for the reference of research and development, let's say for the creation of a particular medicine, we might need a plant which is found in the deep sea. For the preparation of a vaccine to a particular disease, we might need samples from a marine organism. How that will be provided is going to be defined in this treaty. Now, before venturing into how this treaty is going to help, let us understand the background of this treaty. This treaty is actually based on the recommendations of a preparatory committee, which was created in 2015 under the UN. After the recommendation of this treaty, an international or intergovernmental conference was organized in 2017. This conference is known as Conference on Marine Biodiversity of Areas Beyond the National Jurisdiction, that is the High Sea. So it is more like an intergovernmental conference on High Sea for the marine protection. In 2017, this conference was organized. It took different rounds of meetings. And after different rounds of meeting, in 2022, finally they came up with a final agreement that they are going to sign the treaty and recently the treaty was signed. It will bring the binding treaty and this treaty is going to work under the UN clause to which we have already studied. It will provide the conservation and the sustainable use of the marine organism, not the complete ban, which is beyond the national jurisdiction that is high sea. Now, once this treaty is into being practice, it is going to help for achieving the sustainable development goals till 2030 and there are two goals goal number 12 the targets the responsible production and the consumption where 
marine organism is important and goal number 14 which talks about the protection of life below waters the second important argument which is going to be beneficial is the kunming montreal global biodiversity framework now this was signed in december last year and we are going to look at this into much detail now in 2022 un biodiversity conference was organized biodiversity conference was organized with the cop 15 title cop stands here for conference of parties now conference of parties to what conference of parties to the convention on biological diversity which is an outcome of a rio earth summit so kunming kunming is in china montreal is in canada these are the two locations where this conference actually took place so kunming montreal conference took place which is known as conference of parties 15 and called as global biodiversity framework gbf this is extremely important for your prelims as well as the means examination and this conference was actually signed under the convention on biological diversity as per this framework it has provided a comprehensive package that is going to monitor the framework enhance the mechanism for planning monitoring reporting and reviewing the implementation of the framework there will be a financial resources as we have already talked about there is going to be a strategic framework for the capacity development of all the member countries and their scientific cooperation for the marine biodiversity and this has actually brought the digital sequence information on the genetic resources so whatever resources that we are going to find out on the high seas is going to be shared there are four goals to this framework first halting or stopping the human induced extinction of the threatened species in the high seas sustainable use and the management of the biodiversity so that they are not extinct fair sharing of the benefit from the utilization of the genetic resources for example that we have created a vaccine out of an important species from the ocean that should be shared with all the member countries the framework has to say that and the last goal is that adequate means for the implementation of this framework be accessible to all the parties parties means the member nations particularly the poor countries so this framework is going to benefit with the high sea treaty the third important benefit is going to be on the montreal pledge which is known as montreal pledge 3030 now according to the montreal pledge which was taken up in 2022 this pledge was taken under the un biodiversity conference of COP15. It is concluded in Montreal in Canada and it is actually part of the UN Biodiversity Conference COP15. Under this pledge, countries have decided to protect 30% of the planet's land, coastal areas and the inland waterways. So this is also going to benefit from the treaty that was signed recently. So that's how this entire treaty is going to actually benefit the international community and the biodiversity at the ocean. As far as key takeaways are concerned from the COP50, it has provided 30 by 30 targets. There is going to be the combined fund or the money for the protection of the nature. There will be reporting of the impact on biodiversity by each country. Harmful subsidies are going to be discontinued. Pollution and pesticide related steps will be taken up and there will be continuous monitoring and the reporting of the progress of the achievements. So all of these are going to be beneficial for the protection of marine organisms. Now before moving to the need of such a treaty, we should understand what is convention on biological diversity. Well, this convention was actually came into force in 1993 and it is an outcome of the Rio Earth Summit where other two conventions were United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification and the third one was United Nations Framework Convention on the Climate Change. As of now, there are over 195 countries, not US, who have ratified this convention. COP or the Conference of the Party is the main governing body that meets every two years and in 2022, they met the 15th time. 
the important convention of CBDR Nagoa Protocol and the Cartagena Protocol. Under the Nagoa Protocol, it was decided to share the benefits arising out of the utilization of the genetic resources as we have taken the example of vaccine development. Under Cartagena Protocol of the CBD, it was decided that there should be safe handling and transportation and the use of living modified organism to avoid any adverse effect on biodiversity. Now please understand this through an example. Let's say there is an organism and this organism was utilized to create another modified organisms. Now when we are handling, transporting and bringing this organism to the other new environment, there should be some safety which should be protected. For example, we have genetically modified food crops. So when we are shifting that GM crop from one area to the other area, handling safety should be adopted. Otherwise, that might create environmental hazards. The objective of CBD was to conserve the biological diversity for the obvious reason, sustainable use of the biological diversity and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of the genetic resources. Now the question arises why the High Sea Treaty was signed. The last international agreement which was signed for the protection of the ocean was 40 years ago, that is UN clause. So we required a treaty that should meet the demand of the today's world. As of now, only 1.2% of the high sea is actually under protection, which is a very, very small area. As of now, the marine life which are living outside these protected area are under extreme risk from the climate change overfishing, especially the whales and the shipping traffic. So large number of ships are moving from this deep sea or the high sea areas. As per the IUCN, about 10% of the marine species are under threat. And there are number of threats that looms over the existence over the marine biodiversity. For example, there are certain accumulation of the threats. We have nutrient from the lands which are passing into the ocean water which has actually increased the eutrophication. There is increasing acidity. There is marine extension of the species. Microplastic is now entering into the food web and ultimately killing the marine organism. There is the arrival of the new species. There is the issue with respect to managing stresses. Marine heat waves are now increasing because of the climate change. There is a physical damage to the oceans. Sedimentation from the land is now coming up sea level is rising as well as there is a loss of predator in the entire food chain. And because of these multiple regions, nations have come up with this important treaty that was signed very recently. So all the students are requested to go through this treaty thoroughly and try to prepare it for the upcoming prelim and the mains examination. That's all in this discussion. Let's now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page first and talks about the regulator's proposal on Rajasthan power lines that flouts the SC order. Now what regulator is talked about? The regulator is Central Electricity Authority. It is a regulator for the power sector in India and according to Central Electricity Authority, the power lines below the 33 kilowatt will go for the underground work and others are not. The other power lines which are above 33 kilowatt are going to be fitted with the bird diverters. Now there are two important things that we are going to read about. The first important one is of course the great Indian bustard, its status and why it is going through the threats. The second is about the concept of bird diverters. Now why this is a controversy? The great Indian bustard is a critically endangered species of bird. It is found in the western part of India. Some of them are even in the Pakistan. Now this species is actually being threatened because of the high tension lines which are coming from the power sector. High tension lines or the power lines actually kill out this important critically threatened species and they actually fall back on the earth because of the high tension line. As you can see on the screen, this bird actually died because of the collision with the high tension of the power lines.
Now, most of these power lines are coming from the solar powers, which is generating the solar power in the western part of India, especially in the state of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Now, Supreme Court in 2019 came up with a proposal to protect this species and directed all the low voltage power lines to be demarcated as a priority and the potential habitats of Great Indian Bustard. For that matter, government brought a proposal to bring firefly bird diverters. Now, what are these? As you can see on the screen, it has a reflector. This reflector, when seen by the bird, actually make them to change their path. They are installed on the power lines. As you can see, this is a power line. They work as a reflector. And when bird actually spot these reflectors, they try to change their path. They try to divert their flight path and avoid the collision. So according to the Central Electricity Authority, if the power line is above 33 kilowatt, that should go with the reflectors. Power line below 33 should go underground. Now the environmentalist says that this is going to bring the partial relief because we cannot expect all the birds to follow what government is thinking as a diversion from the fly fire bird diverters. There might be some birds who may not get used to the reflectors and still being killed by the wires. Now coming to the great Indian bustard. It is one of the largest flying bird in the world, one of the largest. The reason for their decline is, of course, the loss of their habitat due to the increasing of the population, agricultural infrastructure development and so on. The second important region is collision with the electricity transmission line. That was the actually highlight of the article. And the third is the stray dogs, which are actually known to attack the bustard's eggs. As far as conservation is concerned, so they were declared as critically endangered, which is the highest form of protection an animal can get. They are also listed under Schedule 1, so there is no hunting of these birds. They are also listed under Appendix 1, so no export or import of the uh, birds. And they are also the state bird of the state of Rajasthan. As far as their protection is concerned, so in the state of Rajasthan, Desert National Park is solemnly dedicated for their protection. In Gujarat, there is Nalia Sanctuary. In Madhya Pradesh, there is Karera Wildlife Sanctuary. However, since 90s, there is no such Great Indian Bustard over there. In Maharashtra, there is Nannanch grassland and in Andhra Pradesh, there is Rola Padu Wildlife Sanctuary. So all these five areas were created to protect this critically endangered species in India. As far as other distribution is concerned, though, so they are widely found in India and Pakistan. However, their population is less than 200, including the five or six important states. So below 200 is a very, very critical state for this bird to survive in the wild. So with this discussion place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page three and talks about an important role played by the election commission, which has raised a controversy in the state of Maharashtra. Now, Uddhav Thakre has criticized the role of election commission on its order to award the Shiv Sena's name and party symbol to the existing Chief Minister Eknath Shinde's rival faction. Now, Eknath Shinde, the current Chief Minister of the Maharashtra, has taken the majority section from the erstwhile Shiv Sena and now collaborated with the BJP to form the government in the state. Now, Election Commission has used its order using the paragraph 15 of the Election Symbol Order 1968. Now, as far as anti-defection is concerned, because this is a case of anti-defection and the larger aspect shows that the erstwhile members of Shiv Sena should be called for the defection in the party. This matter is under the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. So we are not going to discuss that till it is under sub -judice. Today, we are going to look into whether Election Commission has the power to do so or not. So Election Commission has provided this symbol, which was used by the Shiv Sena party under the Uddhav Thakre to the existing Chief Minister Eknath Shinde. Now powers of election commission to allot the symbol comes under the paragraph 15 of the election symbol order which says that election commission 
is empowered to decide in relation to splinters group that is the one that has divided or the rival sections of a recognized political party. So through this, they have provided symbols to the other person. Conduct of election rules 1961 further empowers the election commission to specify the symbols for the election in the parliamentary or the assembly constituencies. So given this power, election commission can easily hand over the symbol to the Eknath Shinde or his other party members. But the point is, if this is going to be the trend, will the division of a political party ever be resolved? For example, there's a division of a party, a large national party, and half of its member have decided to go in the different direction. Will there be the same symbol always provided to the new party? Or does this mean that the symbol of a political party will always be carried forward by the majority section and not the minority section? Let's say there are 100 members to a political party in a particular state and 70 of them have now moved to the other section. Will the symbol and the name will also move to the other section or not is going to be decided in the future by the Supreme Court. As of now, according to the para 15 of the election commission, this order is completely legal. The same election symbol order of 1968 also allowed the election commission to allot the symbol, recognize a political party or even suspend and withdraw the recognition of the recognized and the unrecognized political party if they fail to observe the model code of conduct. This does not mean that they could deregister a political party. Now from this order, it can easily be deduced that the use of symbol to a particular person is not applicable. The symbol and the name of a political party will go to that, pol that section of the party where there is majority. Now, as we have said that the larger aspect of this controversy lies with the Supreme Court and the question with the Supreme Court bench is, does internal dissent, because we have seen that there was an internal dissent between the sections of Shiv Sena, does the internal dissent within a political party by the rival faction amounts to split? And if it is a split, can this dissent be covered under the 10th schedule or not? Now, 10th schedule of the Indian constitution talks about that anti-defection law under which defection is the floor crossing or the switching side by a member of one political party to the another political party. However, in the case of Maharashtra, it was not the going from one political party to the other. It was actually the division of the existing political party. Now, through the anti-defection law, paragraph 4 was added which talks about the merger of the political parties. This paragraph says that disqualification on the ground of defection will not be applied if there is a merger of political parties. However, this remains silent in case of the split. This paragraph provides that if the said merger is with two-thirds of the members of the legislative party, who have consented to merge with the another political party. Now, let's say there's a political party and there are 100 members and 67 of these members actually agree to join other political party. Then this will not be qualified as the disqualification. However, on the other side, it does not talks about the existing split in the 100 member party. So that remains the matter of concern and that is under the sub judice and the coming time will only tell us what is going to be the direction of this judgment. That's all for today's daily news simplified. Stay tuned for more such updates. Thank you.